Hi, everyone. I'm just going to give everyone just a couple more minutes to log in. I know it's 5.30, but we'll just give everyone another three, four minutes. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. 
Um, thanks so much for attending this evening's session on anti-racist and anti-oppressive practice in academic anesthesia and surgery. I'm Angela Jerath. I'm an anesthesiologist based at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. Um, my co-host here is uh, Chris Wallace, who's a urologist based at Mount Sinai Hospital. And we are grateful to people who have helped us organise this session, including Joanna, Gabby, and our IT group. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, I know many of you have been great at this, but I can just ask if anyone has logged on with a phone number, could you please just pop your name in rather than a phone number? That would be super appreciated tonight. And feel free throughout the session to pop questions, comments, points into the Q&A. And we will do that at the end of the session. Um, there's no active chat feature on this webinar this evening. And before we kick off, I'd like to share a, a land acknowledgement with everyone. And with us being based here in Toronto, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and the home of many diverse First Nations, Meti, and Inuit people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. I think this evening we all as a team acknowledge that each of us are in our own thoughts and managing our individual personal emotions and challenges at what is a truly difficult time in the world right now. And I think together with empathy and a shared space of sensitivity, I'd like to introduce our speaker, who is Professor Salim Razak. Salim joined the faculty at the University of British Columbia and the BC Children's Hospital in January of this year, after a 25 year long career as a pediatric intensivist and medical educator and researcher at the McGill University. He's well known in this space. He's a senior faculty advisor in the Office of Respectful Environments, Diversity and Inclusion at the Faculty of Medicine at University of BC. And he's an ex-grad of UFT. His research interests include medical education, particularly at the intersection of assessment and professionalism with representation, equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism, for which he has um, received illustrious support from CIHR and SHIRK. He's a recipient of the AFMC May Cohen Award for Outstanding Contributions to Equity in Medical Education, the Hale T. DeVos Award for Contributions to Equity in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at McGill, and also the Pediatric Chairs of Canada Award for Outstanding Contributions to Medical Education. We couldn't have a better speaker this evening on the topic, and I'm going to hand over the forum to Salim. Thank you uh, so much, Angela. Just before we start, I just want a thumbs up that you're hearing me, because I don't want to be speaking into the void. Um, mm. I, uh, I'll, I'm just going to put my slides up and then we'll get started. Uh, let me just make sure. And I'll put the slideshow on. Yes. Are you seeing the slides? Yes. All right. We can get started. And uh, I want to really thank you both uh, for thinking of me and inviting me. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, it is really quite something to present in the place that, uh, that made you, you know, um, U of T made me as a doctor. Um, and, uh, I think of classmates and so on that are in the various hospitals, some of whom are your directors and stuff now because I'm old, um, and, uh, I also think of the city of Toronto, uh, which I would say is one is the first place that I started to think about uh, these issues uh, in a deep way. Um, if you'll permit me, 
I'll, uh, you know, when you think about when I, and I'd like each of you to think as well, when do, when did you start thinking about social justice or being fair to people in, in the practice of medicine or maybe even in life? And if I think about it, it goes right back to Halloween and carrying around a little UNICEF box uh, to trick or treat and to, you know, collect for UNICEF. And I wasn't sure what I was doing when I was doing that, but uh, something about the words United Nations Children's Fund um, somehow told me that that was a good thing to do. Uh, I, th I still think it's a good thing. I, I do think that uh, we're in times where we're thinking greatly about uh, what is the right thing to do and so on. And I hope to... Uh, help you and to be on a journey with you as we think about anti-racist and anti-oppressive practice in, in academic medicine, academic anesthesia and academic surgery. I'm going to make my own land acknowledgement. I'm giving this talk from Vancouver. I'm three hours behind you and I am giving this talk from the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and, Cos and Suelotooth peoples, Coswelotooth peoples. Um, from a place that is known as the University Endowment Lands. That's what UBC is built on. And I think a little bit about who endowed what to whom under whose authority. And uh, I hope as well that we can think about uh, truth and reconciliation during this talk. <clears throat> I have no conflicts of interest to declare. And um, I feel very academically free to give this talk to you. Uh, and I hope that you will feel very academically free uh, to ask me anything that you want uh, as we talk and that we can uh, continue this journey together. This is a picture of Earth, and it's also a picture of Dawn. <clears throat> and the picture on the right is, um, uh, you know, it's me Googling uh, it's always darkest before dawn. So that's a picture that's supposed to represent it's always darkest before dawn. And I, you know, I, I, I just want to um, recognize the times we're in, right? So we've just lived through uh, vicariously, many of us, but some of us directly, the last six or seven weeks of incredible uh, conflict and suffering uh, on the other side of the world. And um, uh, it's having effects on this side of the world as well. And I, I want to just let you all know that um, I hold space for uh, all of that suffering, or I'm going to try my best to hold space for all of that suffering. And, um, you know, I hope that you will hold space for me as well uh, in this time. And... Uh, you know, I struggled with even to mention uh, the, these events, um, but I also des I, I decided that in the end, it would feel very fraudulent to talk about um, equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism without at least acknowledging the times we're in. I want to start, um, you know, this is the pediatrician in me um, who is going to gush for a moment about uh, about my colleagues in anesthesia and my colleagues in surgery. Um, everything that we do in equity and social justice goes back to um, what is our professional contract uh, as uh, with patients? And um, what does that mean? when it's applied to very specific contexts, such as anesthesia and such as surgery. So what I wanna do is I wanna give you my great appreciation for uh, the work that you do. And I wanna interpret a little um, from the end of someone who's been a patient, you know, I've had a little surgery. Uh, so, you know, I've had that 7.45 in the morning lying on that stretcher and the anesthesiologist comes to talk to you and asks, talks to you for maybe about 30 seconds. Um, and in those 30 seconds that he or she is talking to you, um, uh, a relationship is built and actually an IV is inserted without you even knowing that it's happening. Um, and then you go and you have your surgery. And, you know, every specialty has its 
version of the professional contract with patients, you know? And when I think of anesthesia, what is the version for me? The version for me, from my perspective as a patient is, you know, I will give you my physiology to look after during this surgery. And I will, I know that you'll do it well. Uh, and I know that you will um, watch out for me and watch out for my dignity during this surgery. If I think about the surgeon who I'm developing a relationship with as well, that's a little bit different. That's, um, I will let you invade my body uh, because we've decided together that that's the right thing to do for the problem that I have. And I know that that will be a really intimate moment when you're inside my body. And I know that you're going to fight for me uh, very hard. So those, those, you know, why did I gush there for a moment? I gushed there because I really, really do respect the work that you do. But I also want you to bring back some of the things that we're going to talk about uh, to uh, equity and anti-racism and all these things. I want you to bring it back to your professional, uh, your concept of the professional obligations. One of the things, so this talk is, is titled Anti-Racism and Anti-Oppressive Practice. I didn't even mention equity in there. And, you know, I happen to have been around long enough that uh, I have seen the movement of words uh, and the um, words being dropped uh, to describe this work. And um, I want to tell you why we need to make some changes, okay? <laughs> On the left, you have a little bit, um, for me, a representation of equity. And that is a picture of Pablum. For those of you that don't know, uh, Pablum is a an infant cereal. Um, and the history of Pablum is interesting. It was actually invented at, in the University of Toronto at a hospital for sick children. Um, and um, it was licensed out to Gerber. Um, I believe that I'm not 100% sure, and some of you probably know the story. I believe that Sick Children's Hospital still receives royalties from Pablum. Uh, and I believe that was in the 1930s that that was invented. The thing about Pablum that's interesting is that one of the physicians who worked on developing the formula for Pablum later on went on to be part of um, what are now regarded as unethical nutrition studies with Indigenous children. Uh, as a faculty member at the University of Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Children. And why I tell you that is because that is a little bit the story of equity. The story of equity is that there has been something historic and ongoing that is unjust. And that means that our institution and our institutions have been part of that. And that means that our institutions have to think of ways of addressing that injustice. We use the term equity a lot over the last 20 years, and it's it's sort of falling out of favor with, um, with uh, people in the field. And I think the reason behind that is because there isn't enough an, of, of an active sense. There's a need to really do things differently um, that um, con is conveyed by the word equity. And I think that uh, that is why we've moved on to more more terms like building anti-racist practice, building anti-oppressive practice. And the idea there is the picture on the right, is that you may need to dismantle. You may need to think differently about how you know what you know and how you do what you do in order to do things differently. I always like to say, though, is that it doesn't mean if we dismantle the house, it doesn't mean that we throw away the bricks. It means that we put the bricks together in a maybe in a different way. So this is what I want you to think about today with uh, anti-racist and anti-oppressive practice in anesthesia and surgery, which is really how are we going to build this house differently? What is this house composed of? So I like to think of, um, you know, kind of when you're thinking in terms of structures, and uh, processes, um, uh, say in a department of surgery or a department of anesthesia or a hospital anesthesia department, I like to think in terms of three broad buckets that we need to think about 
um, when we think about what needs to change, what needs to be evaluated. And I'm going to present you these three buckets, and then we're going to go through some case examples in these three buckets. So the first bucket is the formal curriculum. And I'm, I'm focusing on what we teach, because what we teach propagates what we do. The first bucket is the formal curriculum. So this is what we say we're going to teach. You are going to do a rotation in pediatric critical care because that's a required um, exposure for you. Um, and um, in that, we are going to teach you these objectives. I think that there are equity issues even within the formal curriculum. Secondly, there's the informal curriculum. And that is, you know, if somebody were to ask you that, that would be like the, an answering the question, this is what it's like. So these are the unscripted and ad hoc and interpersonal relationships and uh, re, um, uh, actions and reactions that go on between, say, teachers and students or colleagues and so on that, um, uh, that create the um, learning and work environment, let's say. Okay, and that's a whole series of things to think about with respect to anti-racism and anti-oppression. Finally, there's the hidden curriculum. And some people have trouble distinguishing between the hidden curriculum and the informal curriculum. But the hidden curriculum is answering the question, this is what we live under, right? Um, what are the organizational structures under which we live, the promotional practices? What are the, um, you know, how do we um, provide services in our critical care units. And in the hidden curriculum, there can be um, also issues with anti-racism and anti-oppression within there. So I'm gonna talk first about a couple examples that are about um, the formal curriculum, what we learn, right? So the first case is the case of Jamal. And I'm going to be using a lot of examples from pediatric critical care. That's the way I can be authentic. I hope that um, they'll speak to you a little bit. And if they don't, um, I, I hope that you can think of examples in your own environment. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll just say, oh, too bad. No, I'm just joking. Um, uh, so the first case is the case of Jamal. So Jamal is a black boy, an 11-year-old black boy. Um, and he drowned. Uh, he had a near. He, he um, made the mistake of jumping into the um, deep end of a pool at a friend's house when he thought it was the shallow end of the pool. And um, he actually needed to be resuscitated on the scene, and he was brought to the intensive care unit, where he um, was in a critical condition for a number of days. And over time, it was. Um, uh, determined that he had very significant anoxic ischemic injury and he succumbed to his injuries. Um, so support was withdrawn. So he is discussed at morbidity and mortality rounds. And in morbidity and mortality rounds, <clears throat> the resident is presenting and um, uh, you know, two of the attendings sitting ba in the back, you know, the kind of the hecklers, you know, like those two Muppets, um, they, uh, they just talk to each other behind the back, like without anybody else really hearing. And um, they say, you know, that's really funny. You know, this is like the fifth black kid in five years who's, um, you know, been, part been, been a victim of drowning. I remember the case of Francois last uh, last year, um, and you know he uh, you know he didn't know how to swim, and um, you know the two of them they remember these cases and they say hmm it's really funny, but that discussion doesn't go anywhere beyond that. They, so so in the case of Jamal, you know the morbidity is discussed and you know nobody discovers anything about the medical care that requires thought and action. So what does this case bring up? This case brings up a very, very important point in anti-racist and anti-oppressive practice, right? And that is that one of the things that we have to teach, one of the habits of mind that we have to have is to appreciate patterns, right? And to 
um, appreciate them in deep and reflective ways, right? So I came of age as a medical student in the, um, you know, in the late 80s, right? 86 to 1990. I was the class of 1990 at U of T. And you are supposed to be shocked because I look so young. Um, but uh, there you have it. I was the class of 1990. And, you know, during that time, that was the time of AIDS, right? And I think back, um, I think back to those early doctors in San Francisco and uh, New York who had practices with a lot of gay men in them who noticed the pattern of Kaposi's sarcoma and reported it to the authorities, right? So they did more than these two did. They, 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 they moved it forward and many of them were engaged in advocacy as well. So we have part of what we have to do is develop a kind of a structural competence, right? So we have to appreciate structures that are not readily apparent, right? So that is, you know, a reflective capacity that encourages metacognition. So uh, we're we're looking through the realm, the lens of science. This is really out of keeping. Uh, this observation is really out of keeping with population share, for instance. But we also have to do something else. And this is something that we don't do as well in, say, the education of residents. We have to help residents access other knowledge systems as well in order to um, apprehend the phenomenon, right? So with the case of Francois, we need to also maybe look a little bit around social determinants, right? So why is it that so many black children are not able to swim? Um, and if you check it out, there's a rich literature. If you check it out, you'll discover that it's all about, you know, when swimming lessons are offered, where swimming lessons are offered within cities. Um, there are some culture, there can be some cultural factors about what is the value of teaching children to swim and so on. And those are the determinants of why Francois did not make it. And I call that refraction. So we need to encourage reflection and refraction. And when we do that, we get an ecological model of disease, right? So we're very used to this idea of, you know, patient presents with nuchal rigidity. Um, it's, you know, it's probably bronchiolitis, it's probably uh, not bronchiolitis, meningitis. And we're going to, uh, you know, put the patient on antibiotics. But I think this is a really important point as well in the way we teach. I think we need to also teach why this disease at this time to this severity in this patient. I once had a um, very savvy um, uh, supervisor who once told me, you know, respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, does not cause bronchiolitis. And then he went on to talk to me about, um, you know, why why the severity of ICU, uh, why the overrepresentation of indigenous patients in our unit with RSV, um, and uh, why uh, mechanical ventilation. And what he was doing, and he was actually an anesthesiologist, by the way, an anesthesiologist who also became a pediatric intensivist. He was getting me to think in terms of a biopsychosocial, but also sociopolitical, economic, and environmental model of illness. And I think that that's one of the things that we need to do in order to engage in anti-racist, anti-oppressive practice. The other, um, the other point that I think I would make is that we also need to think in terms of practicing in culturally safe ways. So the cultural safety paradigm, which was originally elaborated by Ramsden et al. in 2002, and um, was really about, um, so, so she was a Maori nursing educator. And if for those of you on the left, uh, who are wondering what the picture is on the left, the picture on the left is a representation of the Treaty of Waitangi, which is to New Zealand what the British North America Act is to Canada, seen as the founding document of New Zealand, the modern state of New Zealand. And <clears throat> what she did was she situated Maori health within the obligations of that Treaty of Waitangi, brought it to the present and really got us to think about health as occurring within a history of structures of marginalization and oppression, getting us to again ask why this disease at this time 
to this degree and how is it occurring? And I think that the, the thinking in terms of cultural safety is a really, really key skill uh, for both practitioners and for us to teach. How do we do that? I think we do that by developing this notion of critical consciousness in, um, in our learners and in ourselves. And that is, uh, and so for those of you that are wondering, that comes from Brazilian educator Paulo Freire, who um, distinguished between two kinds of education. One kind of education is an education that helps us keep unjust structures in society. And then there's another kind of education which gets us to question unjust structures in society. I would say that by and large, a medical education and a medical process of professionalization, and it, it's not even my opinion, this is there's quite a bit of literature on this, is really a process of thinking a certain way and thinking uncritically about um, injustices and so on. So I think we need to bring in a little bit about the idea of critical consciousness, which is a recognition of individuals as conscious, reflective, and social beings who are aware of social contradictions and injustice, and that they also have a commitment to act and overcome. So they need to develop their structural competence, as I was talking about, the ability to read the world, but also that they have a commitment through their professional obligations to act. The second case is COVID and race. So let's imagine Wednesday afternoon journal club for critical care fellows. So this is um, a, a paper in chest is being discussed, which looks at COVID outcomes and race. And it's a really important paper because it shows that critically ill um, adults um, are actually, um, when they when race is factored in, uh, race ends up being an important uh, outcome factor for mortality. So the supervising attending for the journal club asks, you know, race has been identified as a risk factor in this paper. What do you think about this, right? So one of the fellows who's kind of sitting in the background, um, she thinks to herself, um, and she's racialized, actually, she thinks to herself, you know, is it really race that's the right term, you know? Um, because, you know, race is socially constructed, right? So when you say race, you put it inside the person that's a problem rather than in that person's relationship to society. So shouldn't we really be calling it being racialized as or experiencing racism as that is the risk factor? And she raises her hand very tentatively and she tells the um, supervisor that. And then the supervisor kind of rolls her eyes and says, you know, this paper was published in Chest and it went through peer review. And that's, that's really not what I wanted to talk about with this particular case. Um, uh, it's important what you're saying, but we'll get back to it at some other time. And that student or that fellow feels silenced. So lots to talk about there. We can talk about the learning environment, but I want to choose to talk about um, actually the knowledge system, right? So, um, and... I think what we need to also teach students is to understand the logic of health, of medic, the medical knowledge. Um, and medical knowledge is based upon white supremacist knowledge systems that actually promote, and there's literature that um, kind of traces um, the history, um, the uneasy relationship with the eugenics movement and the echoes of all of that today uh, in how we teach and learn about race and so on. But one of the issues that we, we have to confront is that we're teaching about some of, and when we teach about illness, we often teach in ways that are racially hierarchical, that present others as inferior, and that really don't talk about the proper social determinant uh, that is active. Uh, so racially hierarchical with anti-Indigenous racism, anti-Black racism, anti-Semitism and uh, Islamophobia and the multiple kinds of anti-brownnesses. Some of you may be wondering why I put anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. First of all, I hate the term Islamophobia because that focuses on the fear of the person who's committing the act rather than calling it what I think it should be called, which is anti-Muslim racism. Um, but anti-Semitism uh, and, and Islamophobia 
are very old um, in Western civilization. And in fact, they probably predate notions of race, but they have a lot of similarities to, to, to race. So I situate them in there. And we can talk about that. Uh, that's actually an academic interest of mine, the history of those. Um, medical systems are also very patriarchal, right? Like if we teach about the symptoms of women presenting with myocardial infarction as atypical in comparison to men, that's a social choice to do that. Um, of course, we're going to notice outcome differences in the practice, in the uh, treatment of myocardial infarction. It's also cis and heteronormative and profoundly ableist. And if we think in those terms and look at what we're teaching and look at what we're thinking, we'll go a long way to uh, bring in anti-racist practice. Whoops. There. And what is, what's going on here? Well, I think what we need to do is we need to provide spaces where there's criticality going on. So criticality uh, versus a normalizing pedagogy. And what do I mean by a normalizing pedagogy? When we join medicine, it is we agree to think a certain way. Um, you know, we agree to think scientifically, right? We're go when the sodium is 147, I'm going to try and set, try and understand the fluid status of that patient as well. And it works and it's meaningful to us, but that's what we agree to do. Um, the other thing we agree to is to forever and henceforth be reviewed by peers. Like all processes in medicine depend on peer review. And finally, we agree to be socialized within a professional identity as an anesthesiologist, as a surgeon. And I think that those things only take us so far. They, they, they go awry when we have to confront how our systems have been part of injustices. And how do we do that? Well, there's two ways, and I'll talk a little bit later about um, pedagogies of love, but rooted in critical consciousness development. And um, I, I also am very fond of the Mi'kmaq um, concept of two-eyed seeing, which, have been, which has been published by several indigenous authors, uh, including uh, Makevit. And um, it's the idea that you can look at this phenomena through two different kinds of eyes and, um, you know, apprehend different knowledge from the phenomena. And what do I mean by that? I'm going to give you an example. So in epidemiology, we spend a lot of time defining populations, right? So I'd like you to, I, mean, I don't have time to go into it much, but I'd like you to think about what does it mean to say that a population is at risk, right? Uh, so I'll give you an example here. Um, of uh, uh, on the left is our world, and on the right is a parallel universe. So in this, in the, in our world, we are studying a gene frequency. We've decided a pop the population has a gene frequency differences, and we've divided the world up. And this gene is important for disease. We've divided the world up into white and non-white people. And we discover that in a sample of 100, that four out of 50 of the white people carry the gene um, and um, 38 out of the 50 in the non-white population carry the gene. So from that, a paper is written and the recommendations are to develop specific screening strategies for non-white populations. So, so let's now move to a parallel universe where the exact same individuals are there, um, except in this world, people with big feet conquered the world. And um, they were the ones that did well socially, ended up running countries and so on and making alliances with local populations that also had big feet. And then it became socially meaningful to have big feet in that population. So in the, the same study is carried out and we find out that people with size 10 feet or greater and carry the gene is two out of 30. And people with size 10 feet, uh, with feet si less than size 10 and carry the gene is 40 out of 70. And we then therefore come up with, um, you know, screening recommendations based upon foot size. What I'm pointing out to you here is a fundamental issue with um, research, which is that we have to, there isn't a single population that I can think of almost, uh, there's maybe one or two that is not socially defined, right? And yet what we do is we make observations about that population in the scientific domains and then kind of um, uh, 
sometimes a lot of times forget about the social social causations of things, the possible social causations of things. So this is an example, and this would be something to bring into I I think graduate student teaching, something like that. The other thing that we do, I don't know if you still do it, but when I went to U of T uh, in the big bad old 80s, I learned about the 70 kilo white male, right? Like I learned about his GFR, I learned about his PFTs. You could talk about um you could talk about um, the four years of pediatrics that I did as showing the children were just deviants from all of that. And, um, um, you know, that um, that's a problem. When you, when you organize knowledge that way and present knowledge that way, what you do is you create a center to your diversity of your population, and then everything else is a deviation or eccentric to that. And the example of kind of um, the example of calling women's symptoms atypical is an example of that. And there are many, many examples of that in the organization of our of our training. So I'd get us to think about that as well. So case three. So this is the case of when the system harms. So this is um, uh, moving on a little and uh, thinking about the system. So um, this is a patient who went on VV, venovenous ECMO for meconium aspiration, a newborn that was born with meconium aspiration and comes to our unit uh, for VV ECMO. Mother had a uterine rupture. Um, and that's why the baby was distressed and uh, aspirated, uh, aspirated um, uh, meconium. Mothers of black race. And um, when she comes to visit, you know, she's wheeled in a, like a day or two later after she's recovering from her emergency cesarean. She tells the fellow, she says, you know, I kept telling them that the pain was different this time. And they kept telling me to push. This is my fourth kid. I know, I knew that something was wrong. And uh, that fellow is not sure what to do about it. What is this an example of? This is an example of potential. I'm going to be charitable here, and I'm going to say potential systemic discrimination in healthcare. So we know very well that um, hospitals have trouble appreciating uh, and believing pain symptoms in Black women and Black men. And this may be an example of that. And I think that what a case like this brings up is the issue of teaching and appreciating systemic and structural discriminations in healthcare is something that we really must do. I've given you two examples there. So one is the example of race correction. You know, that is the uh, example of, um, you know, for instance, coming up with different normal values for creatinine for dependent upon race, which doesn't happen too much in Canada but does happen in other jurisdictions and uh, which has a terrible history. It's always been almost always been used in ways that are unjust to the populations being served, access to renal transplant, those kinds of things. So ending the practice of race correction is, would be a good thing to do. And the second one is an example from pediatric anesthesia, which is a paper which looked at children receiving mundane surgeries um, classified as ASA categories one and two, so not very at risk. Um, and it was a QA study in a large database that um, showed, um, you know, different mortality rates based upon race. So what I take away from that is that when you look at the perioperative process from, you know, kind of presentation to recovery room to discharge home, there is probably within there factors of systemic discrimination. And I think with the biggest, um, the biggest uh, clue to that is that the kids were dis were judged as ASA type one and two, uh, all of them. And what this brings up for me is the idea that we really must, uh, when we're doing our root cause analyses, when we're doing our QI rounds and our patient safety rounds, we need to add another arrow and that arrow has to be systemic discrimination, at least asking the question. In traditional clinical skills, we talk about the doctor, the patient, and the illness, right? And we take a history from a patient, and we um, have the illness that sort of affects the patient, and we apply a paradigm that results in treatments to treat the illness. That is good. That has served us well. But I think that we need to move to a new clinical skills paradigm where there's something around all of this, and that's the sociopolitical and ecological context. Um, 
in which we um, have more like a two-way communication between all of these, these things where we take histories, but we also hear patient stories. Uh, we understand that diseases can affect health, but a patient can help can affect a disease where the paradigm may need to be questioned. The usefulness of the paradigm that we're applying may need to be questioned. So now I've talked a lot about the formal curriculum. I'd like to move to the informal curriculum. So this is the case of Dr. Young. So Dr. Young is a senior cardiologist and Dr. Young is a division director and he comes to your office. Uh, maybe you're a program director or yourself, the chair of the department to discuss a complaint from a female resident. So Dr. Young gets great teaching evaluations. The word on the street among the residents, so he's an interventional cardiologist. So the word on the street is that he's gonna let you do stuff in the uh, cath lab and they're all excited. And you know the, the student was very excited. So Dr. Young is really puzzled, right? So he, he, he called her, he said, when she accessed the vein and did the right, you know, put in the, close the ASD with the device. Um, you know, he said, great job, sweetie. So she was kind of like, she didn't say anything at the time. And she then went to her program director and the program director um, then went to Dr. Young. And then Dr. Young just doesn't understand. Um, so what's the question here, right? Like what's, so this is an example of a microaggression. And in the informal environment, to be anti-racist, we have to learn to recognize, believe, and be allies against microaggressions, right? So this chair who may, let's say the chair is a classmate of Dr. Young's. The chair might want to, wants Dr. Young to stop doing this behavior because he, he knows that it wasn't good what Dr. Young said. He might want to appeal to Dr. Young and say, you know, we can't say those things anymore, but that would be very wrong. And here's why it would be very wrong. I happen to have been there 30 years ago and it wasn't fine at all with my female colleagues to be called sweetie back then or now. And sometimes appealing to nostalgia can be a way of actually promoting injustice because you make it seem like the people now uh, have the problem when the problems always exist existed right so what really has happened is all those stories didn't come through history because they were suppressed voices and but that doesn't mean that they weren't there and i think that what we have to do for anti-oppressive best practices in the informal environment is we need to really um learn and understand microaggressions. Hierarchical relationships enable microaggressions to flourish. And what we really need to do is promote a culture of openness to discuss occurrences. I have often, I've dealt with tons of microaggressions in my jobs that I've had. And often what we see is a, di a triad or a tetrad. So this is the attending, the learner who's the recipient, Sometimes the learner is the recipient through something being said about the patient and the learner identifies with the patient. Um, and then there are these witnesses who are not directly affected, but they feel guilty in the moment that they didn't say something. And of course, it's all power dynamics, why they didn't say anything. So we need to spend some energy teaching them how to be good allies, teaching them how to speak up in the moment, upstandership. And we also need to teach our colleagues how to recognize microaggressions. Case number five is a bit more of an extracted case to us as a program. So this is, imagine a, a, an, e, uh, an emergency residency program. So an indigenous youth is brought to emergency and he had a behavioral escalation. Uh, uh, by the police, uh, like he's brought in by the police and he had a behavioral escalation. He is neurodiverse, he's autistic, and um, he does have some substance use problems. And you know what? No, he's, he's restrained and nobody notices a flank hematoma that he has, okay? And what basically happens is that he dies of internal bleeding within 24 hours. And a big uh, inquiry is called like a, it's a major patient safety event that occurs. And in the residency program, there are calls 
to defund the police because this probably came from uh, the police. And they, they're saying, we would like to put the weight of our uh, collectivity as emergency room physicians um, towards this political action of defunding the police. And some more senior colleagues go, is this our lane, right? Is this our lane? And I don't have an answer for you. You're probably waiting for the answer, but I don't have an answer for you. But I'd like to go back to Hippocrates, social justice, and clinical skills, right? So there's often, there's a, a line in Greek translations of the Hippocratic Oath that talk a little bit about um, social justice. And um, it's often brought up to say, equity's always been there, right? So this is the line. Into whatever homes I go, I will enter them for the benefit of the sick, avoiding any voluntary act of impropriety or corruption, including the seduction of women or men, whether they be bond or free. So they're, they're here, here's the translation. So it says, if I make a house call, I'm not going to sleep with any of the men or the women in the house, even if they're enslaved. So I think we can rally around that professional concept. <laughs> Most of us can anyway. I think all of us can. But I think what we are being asked to think today is whether it's also our professional obligation to question the, in this example, to question the institution of slavery as well. So are we allowed to bring in structure into, into what we think? No easy answers. And, uh, and in this case, what happened was um, there was a discussion about what's our expertise, and our expertise is really to talk about trauma and its effects on the human organism. And maybe we can be in we can be in the conversation in that way with um, community members. And maybe we won't do it in, as a collectivity, but we won't impede colleagues who want to do that. And that's what they did. Um, <clears throat> but other colleagues brought up the issue: shouldn't we just be neutral, right? One of the messages I want to give you about neutrality is that neutrality is also a political position. It's a decision to uphold the status quo. So I don't know if that's the right thing to be doing. I think what needs to be done is actually a principled approach, probably rooted in the Hippocratic Oath, uh, where there's a lot of opportunity to discuss what that means in a particular context um, and um, for us to act in that manner. So what do we do? We have to commit to free speech, right? We have to take colleagues at their words. Sometimes these, these kinds of conversations come up a lot with what um, people in training want to do versus what older people want to do. And I think that we need to, we have, we have a role to be development, to, to help colleagues develop their voice as well. Um, you know, younger colleagues develop their voice. Um, and I think what's really important, and not this didn't all come through, uh, sorry about that, the slide seems to have screwed up a little, but mo most of the time when we try and regulate others, um, we are actually, um, we often are calling out the people who are um, critiquing something being said rather than the thing that needs to be critiqued. And the real goal is to create a brave space rather than a safe space and to provide the ability to talk in trauma-informed ways. That's what we need to teach young colleagues about speaking out in terms of a collectivity. So now I'm going to move to the last one that's looking at time. Yep, good. I'll finish, I think, at uh, uh, 50 minutes at 5.30. Um, the hidden curriculum. So I want to tell you about Tamara. Tamara is a colleague of mine. She's given her name, her real name is Samara because she she's allowed me to use uh, to to talk to her, talk about this case. So I was a division director for years. And uh, Tamara came to me and she was returning from maternity leave. And um, she came to me and she said that she would like to be a little progressive about it, you know, and would it be OK if um, if for two days a week she worked from home? Um, uh, you know, and uh, she asked me what my expectations were of office time. I'm ashamed to say that I bristled a little when she asked me that. I was, and you know, this of course is before the last four years have all occurred, and three years have all occurred, and we uh, now know that you can do lots of things on Zoom, such as give grand rounds and so on. Um, and I said, you know, I think you're going to need to be around a little bit more than that. You know, and her and I had a robust relationship. So she went home, she thought about it, she came back, she talked to me and she said, you know, Salim, I'm really mad at you. 
you know, and um, what uh, what came out was my own preconceived notions of what it is to be an intensivist in this division that we're in. And um, I'm proud to say that I grew through that conversation and I understood the need to question what I was seeing as normal. I'm going to give you an example of normal. Um, I don't want to be triggering to people, anybody who's ever sat down in the middle of the night on a toilet seat that was not down. Um, but I want to ask you what you think is the normal position of this, the toilet seat. And um, we can't take your answers, but you know, you probably, you know, probably some, you probably have strong opinions. Um, it should be down. That's normal. In my house, where there are two dads, a son and a daughter, the normal position is up actually for it because we only do number two. We do number two many times a day and we do number one one time a day maybe. My daughter is starting to push that it needs to be down. So she's trying, she's being an activist within that system. In other places, you might say, well, the normal position is for it to be down because so, so we have to be willing to question our procedures. When I started ICU, we used to do seven days call in a row. And then we dropped down to five days. And then we dropped down to cross covering nights and so on. And all of that was evolved during a time when most people were not the primary caregivers for their children. And that has changed. So we have to be willing to question our processes and procedures in order to engage in anti-racism. This shows up a lot in the in the construction of excellence, you know, um, clinician scientist versus advocate versus teacher. And I think that we need to have real conversations about how excellence is being defined. Do we have room for multiple excellences and how are we being fair? And so many things I'm going to skip that one. Um, so many things depend upon developing inclusive notions of merit and excellence. I've seen this debate be expressed um, in the concepts of generalism versus specialization. We live in a world where you can become, um, you know, the cardiac anesthetist who knows how to do echo. Um, and, and that's where people are training, right? And um, But are we training to meet the needs of um, other hospitals as well? So generalism versus specialization, serving the academy versus serving a population. And I think we really need to have conversations about what is excellence in all kinds of arenas. When I, um, when I, engage, when I um, started in ICU, I would have said, so I'm wrapping up now, I'm coming to, to near the end. When I started in ICU, I would have said, and people ask me what I did. I would have said, you know, I support failing organs. If your if your lungs are failing, I I give you respiratory support. If your heart's failing, I give you inotropes. Maybe I give you ECMO. Maybe at the mid range, in the last twenty five years, um, I've been part of the bringing in of the ideas of neuroprotection and neurocritical care into my world. So I might have then moved on to what am I supporting them for? You know, neuroprotection. But I think that there's also another really good metaphor for pediatric critical care practice that would really do us well to think. And maybe this works for surgery and anesthesia as well. But when I do ICU, I see the collision between high technology medicine and a patient's social context. And that creates all kinds of ways of thinking and doing that serve patients better if I engage in that kind of thinking. And what is that? That is developing clinical and academic skills that are for liberation of patients and for solidarity. You know, even it's not even kind of just liberation, liberation. We talk about we talk about ICU liberation now because we've realized that patients are a big part of their healing. So we act with patients versus on them. We empower patients. We engage in dialogic interactions that are relatively non-hierarchical. And, you know, so much, and I've been, done equity work for so long that I have been around when there have been conversations between why did you have a Black History Month event, but you did not have a Queer History Month event? The last thing we want is to have marginalized people fighting with each other. So we need to also encourage 
um, a solidarity as well as we're going. And that's a very, very big part of what makes me tick. The last, last slide is this. And this is a representation of ICU practice, if you're wondering, um, for me. And it's the idea of humility. So for me, I'm a pediatric critical care physician. I am the parsley on top of the roast beef. That parsley is very good parsley. It's actually Italian parsley, right? That parsley means that we are in a very good restaurant. But the roast beef and the uh, gravy, that's stuff like vaccinating children, teaching children to read and write, um, making sure everybody has access to healthcare. And that is my place. That parsley is my place in that world. The plate, the plate are the, is the obstetricians. Those nine months spent inside the womb affect the next eight or nine year, 90, eight or nine decades of your life. And I think that if we were able to teach that, we would go a long way as well in terms of building anti-racist and anti-oppressive practice um, in the three missions. Um, so thank you very much. I'm going to stop my slideshow and I look forward to some questions. I went one minute over time. Um, let me uh, stop my slideshow. There we go. Thank you, Salim. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Very thoughtful and I think thought provoking, difficult topic to talk about. And I think for a lot of people to listen to as well. Um, as we're waiting for a few questions to come in, you know, Chris and I are going to pick your brain a little bit. You know, you, you talked a lot about the curriculum and the hidden curriculum and what resonated strongly was patients from different backgrounds and cultures can express symptomology very differently. And I'm, my background is Indian. I know pain perception amongst particularly my older parents who have now deceased. It's expressed in a really different way. And I've been trained in a very traditional way. I, I wonder, you know, your impressions being involved in education now is how do we share some of these common symptomologies amongst trainees now and try and bury this into the formal curriculum so we're a bit more aware of perhaps different ways of expression and even feeling? I think it's, um, so a city like Toronto is a, um... A beautiful city to 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 learn that in, of course, right? So, some people describe it as the most multicultural city in the world, right? Um, by certain measures, it has more foreign-born people than any other city in the world. Um, so you you have a laboratory, but there's a right way and a wrong way to teach it, and um, uh, and I say that as someone who's done it the wrong way. Okay, um, so um, in in 1996, when I started and I was teaching you about cultural differences, say, like some of the stuff we're talking about, I would have been teaching you um, to look at the still life of the fruit and say, look at the pretty colors, right? So you, you would be appreciating things and so on and um, not really going beyond that. At the midpoint, I was getting into this idea, oh, maybe uh, let's look at the still life painting and maybe it contains some tropical fruit and you to appreciate them, you need to shine a different light on it. So you need to have different competencies. And that's what you've been, um, that's what you're um, uh, uh, kind of intimating at is the idea that we wanna teach people, you know, um, how pain presents differently in different cultures, for instance, right? And I think that that's important. Um, but I think we need to move to this new 2023 version of things, which is let's look at the still life painting and let's try and decide what's the logic of this painting. Is it an expressionist painting? And when and if it is an expressionist painting, why is it? Why are certain colors in prominence and not? So the structures we have to look at the structures, uh, and teach about that. So uh, that was a bit long winded, but let me bring it together for you. Um, it is the idea that there will be differences that you that you have and that you absolutely need to know about the common ones in the group that you the groups that you look after but what you will not do is you will not apply that as a truth you will apply that as a hypothesis because it might not be true 
right? We've all, uh, well, none of, I don't know how many of you are pediatric in there, but we've all had the Jehovah's Witness patients who um, whose parents actually want you to say, I'm transfusing their kid because they don't want to be the one to say, you can transfuse my kid, right? So they believe their thing, but they also believe your thing. And um, I think that um, we see this, um, we see this showing up in um, when, when it's applied as a stereotype rather than as a hypothesis. And, we, and so much of that is teaching in the, on the wards and all of that. Don't know if that answers it. Thank you. That question I was going to ask, which is, how do we move from a sort of, um, you know, stereotypic assessment of what we presume people to be based on some sociodemographic we gather about them to just um, uh, like an individual acknowledgement that their experience may differ from ours in a way that's important, but may not be fully captured by any yeah. of these labels we can we can throw on people. Right. So, um, and that, when you think about how to teach that well, um, that, and I, I apologize if I'm always talking about teaching, but that's what I know. I know a lot about medical education, right? But um, uh, it's, um, it's about teaching the difference between taking someone's history and hearing someone's story. So it's narrative tech, it, it's understanding narrative, uh, narrative techniques, which is a person tells you something and they they have made an act of meaning in what they're telling you so that you're trying to apprehend what they're meaning from it. And I'll give you an example. It's a really little one. So I once looked after a 14-year-old girl who was a competitive gymnast and she had scoliosis surgery. And, you know, they, they come to the ICU for the first night after scoliosis surgery because they may have some bleeding and so on. And the, um, and um, the, I, I was with the orthopedic surgeon who was giving, you know, I was a fellow at the time, and there was with the orthopedic surgeon who was giving, you know, talking to the girl the next morning. And what he said to her was, you know, there are so many other sports that you can think of doing, right? And um, that did not land well with the girl, right? And um, it's because, you know, and nothing wrong, you know, I have, I have, totally screwed up people's stories. I, I don't want to talk about my orthopedic colleague as doing, you know, doing something wrong. But um, that the, the, the problem there is that we didn't hear her, right? Like sh for her competent, this was bad news, right? Like competitive gymnast, gym, uh, gymnastics was her thing. And I think what we have to do is be willing to hear people's stories. And you know, that, that, that story of the um, VV ECMO and the mother saying, um, that's a true story. It happened. Um, and what we have to also be willing to is appreciate through deep listening that we might be part of that story and we might not be a good part of that story. You know, uh, we in medicine might be part of systemic discrimination, for instance. Uh, been a... Go ahead, Chris. Okay. okay, we have one question from Dr. Orser, and I encourage other people in the audience to join in as well. But Dr. Orser is asking, um, should we and maybe how should we include factors related to determinants of health as a component of patient assessment? Yeah, um, so um, I think, so, so when you, so this is this idea of how do you bring this to the bedside, right? Uh, and um, one of the things that, I, and I, I feel I can say this in a tongue-in-cheek kind of way as a, as a super-duper specialized person, uh, you know, with all the machines and so on. One of the things that we can do badly, we specialized people, is we can sort of think, oh, that's for the family docs to do, right? So that's something I want to not, not do, okay? So what is the relevance in the moment? So the relevance in the moment is how illness is going to be experienced, how the healthcare system is going to be experienced. There are actually also some very, very hard outcomes that we need to, to think about, right? So every single patient safety outcome that patients, um, that hospitals follow, you know, falls out of bed, um, medication errors, all those kinds of things, 
all of those things occur with greater frequency in persons that are marginalized, right? Structurally marginalized, right? So that's what that's what we're trying to prevent, right? So I think that we need to bring in our questions, right? So questions would be things like, not necessarily who you are, but you know, maybe do you understand English or French well? Do you, um, what's your, you know, get an assessment of literacy level, get an assessment of um, health behaviors as those um, affect, uh, uh, behaviors as those affect health in order to impact upon them, say, during an illness, during a surgical journey from diagnosis to rehabilitation, where you're just the parsley. You're the parsley that cut into the patient or intubated the patient and gave them a little sevoflurane. Um, and, um, uh, but you are part of this continuum and you have a role in ensuring that that continuum happens. Dr. Deb was asking, or his uh, this is sort of a comment and question, I think, and he, he commented that um, in medical education, we don't really have a formalized way of teaching uh, trainees about these sort of approaches to patients in an anti-racist or anti-oppressive manner. So he was wondering if you have some suggestions to implement this kind of a curriculum, and, and that may be relevant in our medical schools and our residency programs, but also among... <laughs> Um, you know, practicing physicians and other members of the, the team. Yeah, so I do have some thoughts. Um, so first of all, there's probably, there probably is a role for like the lecture where, um, where um, concepts are introduced. Okay, you know, like what is anti-racism? What is systemic discrimination? Um, so on and so forth. But that that ain't it. That isn't enough, right? I think what really needs to happen is that it has to be grounded in practice, right? So I don't, I, I, I don't know if there are any pediatric anesthesiologists on there, uh, on here. But that paper, that paper that I put up a, about perioperative uh, systemic racism and perioperative practice, that should be something that you look at with your colleagues, uh, maybe in a journal club, and where they try and understand the perioperative, the organization of perioperative care, which they often don't think of, right? Um, you know, um, simple things like um, they have to go get their hospital card here, and then maybe they have to go to the third floor, but it's actually... It looks like the OR, even though there's a little clinic part to it and it, people get confused and, you know, um, the organization of healthcare and how that may have within it systemic uh, discriminations um, related to it. Um, um, you know, uh, a, another example is the pulse oximetry um, story, which I, I think most of the anesthesiologists uh, will know. Um, but that's an example of how little things add up to create different outcomes um, in COVID, for instance. So I think it's really rooting it in that. And in, in surgery, there are beautiful examples as well. Like there's a, there's a beautiful example around transplant medicine. Um, there was a paper in uh, BC, it's an older one now, that looked at the indications for liver transplant between Indigenous and non-Indigenous patients right? And they had different indications, right? Which it didn't quite get to it, but it hinted at systemic racism in transplant practices, right? So I think that there are things that we, we really have to um, ground it in, in the kinds of things that you do, right? So um, uh, Chris, you're a urologist, right? So uh, I'm, you know, I'm a man in my 50s. I want you to do well in urology. Um, uh, 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 and um, you might have to think about, you know, prostate cancer and race, you know, bring, bring up, you know, you know, teach about that and give it relevance with the patient in front of you. Absolutely. Uh, and do you want to take the next question through? Or no. you, want me to... you go ahead. Okay, so we have a question from um, Dr. Isaac here. Uh, she um, is commenting on your story of the youth in the emergency room and the missed blank hematoma. <coughs> she, says she suspects that there are a few lessons related to the fact that it may have been missed, but the search for the source of the behavior might not have been done. So how does this relate to other situations with trying to help 
children with neurodiversity and how can the uh, sort of team learn from the experience? Yeah, so this, um, so this is an indigenous youth and it's, it's um, a composite of a few different stories, but there are some famous adult stories that actually, um, you know, have been the subject of inquest. Um, Brian Sinclair in um, Manitoba and Joyce Eshaquan in uh, Quebec. And um, I think one of the things that we have to confront is the stereotyping. So this youth had substance use disorder and that's what it was ascribed to. His agitation, which ended up being massive pain from intra-abdominal bleeding, um, was ascribed to um, uh, to being, you know, high. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of things that contributed to that. Like, so this youth was well known at this emergency room, right? He often came to this emergency room. So they were, um, they had kind of like a fixation error problem going on, right? But they also had systemic racism going on, right? This was another you know, this was really fitting into, and I don't want to trigger anyone in the audience. Uh, and I, if if I do, I'm doing it in a way for us to learn. Um, and that this fits the drunk Indian trope that is a really, really common part of practice. And what we need to do is we need to have people um, conscious of these things possibly affecting how they're perceiving a situation. And nice to hear from you, Lisa. Uh, I want to maybe pick your mind about how we take this a bit broader, right? We, we can, we've been talking about directly taking it to the patient bedside, but a lot of the situations you're describing don't reflect really individual um, circumstances. It reflects a societal um, uh, issue and a societal sort of a, a micro manifestation of a, a macro issue. And so, how do you see, or, or what are your thoughts on the role of a physician, either on their own or as a representative of some larger group, to advocate on you know, issues at a societal level? Yeah, so I think that, so first of all, there's the individual and the collectivity, okay? Um, I, have a, I have a few comments, okay? So the first comment I wanna make is that when we, you know, like, say we identify, so in pediatrics, we, we can identify um, kind of like overcrowding as a reason in indigenous communities as a reason for higher, uh, higher, um, you know, um, infection, respiratory infections or something. And then that can kind of be really, really abstract for us, because that's all of Canada and so on. And there's a role for that. But that, you know, what I used to say to the residents when I, you know, I, and I say it here too in BC is I would say, what was B, what is BCCH's role in all of this, right? Like, so we have to bring it to the meso level where people can actually act, right? Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of doing that. But in terms of acting as a single person, I think that people need to be taught the skills of non-colonizing advocacy, right? So that is um, that is offering my expertise, but not dictating the agenda. That is um, asking, um, say, indigenous communities, um, you know, what do you want from me? And I'm going to do it. I'll do it for you. And and what I give is my expertise, right? Like my science, my understanding of illness and so on. That's what I give. Um, and uh, so so that's it on the individual level. And then as a collectivity, right? Um, you know, often we appreciate dysfunctions within our institutions, right? So making those kinds of changes is really political. And being political means, you know, amassing allies and all of that. And we have to have conversations with trainees that this is the kind of thing that we're doing, you know, to try and make changes. Because often people are learning these things on the sly. I mean, I don't know what Toronto's like, but probably the institutions are all highly functional um, places. Um, 
but um, the places I've been have um, been a bit different. I'm going to pick your brain about microaggressions. It's mm -hmm. a popular theme in the hospital and I think really relevant. And I think it's hard for leaders to have those crucial conversations. I think it's hard for people who have received the aggression to speak up. And then there's a lot of bystanders who may have, are going to remain quiet because that's the way it's been. Yeah. If you needed to coach a group on how to start tackling this, what would be some resources and tips and thoughts that, you know, you've seen that might have some benefit? Okay. So lots of thoughts. And, you know, I didn't talk about microaggressions too, too much because it, I wanted to really prevent, but it's really a talk in and of itself. But um, so you're, you're absolutely right that microaggressions are a very, very important. Every environment that I've been in, there have been tons of microaggressions. Okay. And I, I, I don't think it's different anywhere else. And they're often based on gender, race, and sexuality. Those are the big ones that you see um, uh, going on. And um, there often is a power dynamic going on in there. So I think I would concentrate on two kinds of things, structure and agency. Okay, so structure. Let's start with structure. So this is, this is talking to leaders. Right. So leaders need to know a few things about microaggressions. And I I'll say this is a truth. I don't know if it's a truth at U of T, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, a lot of people do. Not, a lot of people wouldn't report because they have no trust in the system. OK, I bet you that's true at U of T because it's true everywhere I've ever been. And the, the reason is that they don't see people being held to account for what they've done. And um, even the people kind of on the power end who might be committing the microaggressions, they also feel, they feel kind of like the other way around that the, the, um, the punishments are too much. And, you know, like, so something you, you need to assure yourself of the integrity of your system for dealing with things. Right. And that is going to be the way that people develop trust in the system. And just to finish that particular part of it, I used to have ethical challenges whenever um, people would come to me with microaggressions because I, so I always accompanied them. You know, I always said I can be with you during these, during, as you move through and here are your ways of dealing with it. Um, but I also knew that the system was really, really imperfect and that people who said things could actually end up being punished, right? Like, so I, 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 I always felt that I had to tell them that, right? um as well so that's that's the structure side of it now agency so agency there's there's many um frameworks in the literature but there's the upstander framework is one and you can google it and see is one of the ones that i really like it teaches people to be good upstanders to recognize what is what what is being seen and to also recognize that their intervention is really, really important for the person um, who's the recipient of the uh, microaggression. And then there are, you know, that I, I would also, I would add that another place, um, there's two more places. The other place is the teachers and the supervisors and making sure that they know what these things are. Because a, a typical thing is that you walk in to give a microaggression, um, you know, workshop. I don't know if this happens at U of T, maybe probably not anymore. But when I used to come in, because I used to be called in to give these things, um, it would be um, like a lot of people would say, what's a microaggression, right? Like they were not, they were, we were not starting in, um, so you, you have to help people with the vocabulary. And then the person who's receiving it, that person needs to know that you saw what happened, you heard them, you, you accept what happened to them. You know, um, just to give a, a little example, you know, it's often that trainees receive, particularly black trainees, um, receive um, racism from patients, right? And um, I've seen the kind of reaction that's kind of rooted in the Hippocratic Oath, which is sort of like, well, we really have a fiduciary relationship to the patient. Uh, 
people need to take it right like you, you know yes. and that is that is incorrect um it is incorrect because people because th that learner that learner's safety is is really really important and that learner needs to know that it's not okay you know and uh we need to be providing sources of support for the learners as well thank you so i uh i think you um alluded to this a little bit with your comment about um the sort of upstander program but i was wondering if you have any um specific advice or or thoughts and this is a question from the group about you know how to really operationalize this even those of us who have your know, relative privilege in the system whether from like seniority or or other reasons you know it can be you know it can be sort of a go along to get along kind of um you know environment in which it's really hard to be the one uh who is the uh you know the the person to step up and and make a comment um when the rest of the group is not doing so so to the chairs in the audience i don't know if there are any um because i can't see but um you need to provide top cover to people right so you need to set the tone that our learning environment is we we are striving for a learning environment that is free of these things um that we are um thoughtful and compassionate to everyone so that means you know that that doesn't mean that like you're off the island if you commit one of these things that we, we're going to try and help you figure out how to be better next time um and um and so on, so that, that there needs to be an environment where that has been clarified so that the lowly program director, and I'm saying lowly because I was a program director, so I know um, that lowly program director who's, you know, hearing these stories and help moving it forward um, actually is able to do so, has, has been properly top covered in order to do so. Um, and I think, I think that it, it's, it's about having the policies and procedures in place, which are probably, to be fair, are probably looked after by U of T already, or, you know, Department of Anesthesia, Department of Surgery, um, and um, making sure that everybody knows what these are, and uh, then providing um, a kind of an account of people's accountability for their behaviors. I don't know if that answers it, but it, it's really the, the idea, like, I think it begins from the top, actually. Yeah, just you know, we're we're trying to address structural and organizational issues, so it would make sense that there are solutions yeah. that begin at that level. I think we got yeah. one last um, sort of comment and question from Dr. Isaac, uh, who, as you know, works in pediatric pain, and um, she has again questions around sort of the in organizational structure. That I think we keep looping back to, and so I think this applies equally, you know, maybe even more so for those of us who are surgeons and in charge of managing our wait list, but. Um, she asked, how do we stop ourselves from responding more to the squeaky wheel? And, you know, I certainly see a lot of patients, you know, the urology practice in downtown Toronto is rife with um, well-connected and highly health literate patients who will do everything they can to uh, get their care taken care of. And so, uh, you know, Dr. Isaac's question about how maybe suggestions you have about organizational changes to minimize that sort of benefit that the squeaky wheel gets and, and the marginalization that comes for those who don't really understand how to use the system um, or, or work within it. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine your practice full of people like me um, kind of doing well, but, you know, get up two or three times a night at this point. Um, so um, that's maybe too much information, but um, no, I think to, to, to bring it back, I think it's um, I think there are again structures and agency, right? So let's do the agency side with this one a little bit more. Um, I think that you have to be conscious of well-known things in the literature that you're probably doing, right? So um, you know it's well known, and there's several many papers that really show this that um, we spend more time talking to people who are socially closer to us than those who are socially distant to us, right? So once you know that, you might actually 
um, you know, knowing is a way to kind of start addressing, right? And then, you know, it's even teaching, right? You know, it's teaching, right? And teaching and modeling, you know, um, with that student, you know, you might mention the paper that says that and then model how you consciously try to spend a similar amount of time with uh, the family that you know, doesn't speak English well, for instance, as an example. So I think I think it's about knowing that there, and the literature is full of the patient safety literature is full of all kinds of things like this, right? So it's not as if this it's hard to find. Knowing these things so that you can teach and do differently. But I also think that um, you know things like jumping the queue and all of that. There will always be little threats to the system um, around that. Um, but you need to build in place practices to address anybody's concerns as they were say, for instance, on a waiting list and so on. Um, and also to, uh, ensure that the system has integrity, uh, that people aren't jumping the queue and so on, um, uh, for the, the squeaky wheels are not jumping the queue. Thanks, Salim. I think we're going to wrap up. It's uh, 7 p.m. here, and uh, we thank everyone for coming this evening and all your wonderful questions. Salim, it's a pleasure. Thank you for our journey of education in this new area, and uh, I'm sure there's much more to come yet. Thank you very much for having me. I hope it was useful, and uh, don't feel free to email me if you have any questions. We'll Take do. care, everyone. Thank you again. Thank Good night, everyone. Bye.